Wake up, wake up. Welcome back. It's Damon and Larry. And Larry, we got a lot to hop into today. Kyle had an awful lot to say to the media at the uh, Orlando meetings for the NFL. And I think we just hop right in with the optimism that he has for Brock Purdy, 3.0, if you will, finally being able to have a legit offseason. And that's where I think we need to start today. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people were asking, hey, you know, what's the next step for Brock? There is no next step for Brock. It's just he continues to, you know, hone his craft and get better. And now he gets a regular offseason. Uh, he's gotten married. And, um, you know, as Shanahan said, you know, the whole goal for Brock Purdy is just get more consistent at everything. You know, review the reps, review the the the, the Super Bowl. Uh, review the playoff reps. You know, I'm sure they put several things on film in the last month that Shanahan would and the coaching staff would love to, you know, review and and then correct and take it to the field. So it's all about perfecting and and they haven't added any new wide receiver of note. They haven't added any new tight end of note. There's no there's nobody that he needs to get in lockstep with like right now pre draft. It's just all about trying to perfect what he does well and the other big takeaway and i don't think that kyle shanahan is giving brandon Ayuk's important importance to this offseason to brock purdy's development to brock purdy's offseason to the just the team's you know connectivity if i could borrow a word from the golden state warriors larry um he talked about brandon Ayuk in such glowing terms it made me just think that you know kyle's desire is to get Brandon Ayuk back. And I do think that that's what they're working on right now. And more than anything, for those who want to say, well, never, you know, never take any coach's word just on its face value. I don't think he's talking to Brandon Ayuk to increase trade value. I don't think Brandon Ayuk is the type of player who needs a coach talking him up to, you know, create a market for him. Brandon Ayuk is in his prime. He's a coveted player. And I think the team that coveted him, covet him the most and should is the San Francisco 49ers. Well, I think the Niners, you know, this is not their first rodeo, right? Now Lynch has been through this. Parag's been through this. Shanahan's been through this. They understand how to play the game. You know, I mean, they they don't have an unlimited budget. It's a finite, very finite um, <clears throat> salary cap. So you say everything that you feel, and but you spend only what you can spend. So... I don't think I don't draw any correlation at all between what they say and what they may do with Brandon Ayuk. Um, he did say it was huge to have, you know, the for Purdy to have a connection like he has with Ayuk. That was one thing he pointed out. He also said he ran into Ayuk in Cabo. And I don't know if I would believe that, uh, that they just automatically ran into each other. Something said, hey, you know what? You're going to go be in Cabo. Let's let's meet down there. And then, um, and then when Shanahan was asked about kind of his approach to the negotiations, he said, be patient. It will work itself out. So it may work itself out or, and they may come to some common ground or it may not. And the wide receiver market could escalate way beyond their means and they could wind up trading him. And it sounds like if that scenario comes up, they're at least having conversations with teams and looking at prospects that would be there in the middle of the first round. And then I think the the one, I don't know if you want to call it revelation, but the one thing that I think does kind of ring true to me is that if they go through the entire first round and nobody's offered them anything, they're not trading him. They're not trading him for some combination of day two and day three picks and a player or this and that. Nobody's going to get an overwhelming bargain they'll either bite the bullet and, and figure it out later, or they'll move them on draft day for a number one. Right. Any conversation for IU begins with a day one pick. And I just hope that they don't find that conversation because man, I really thought at his little, you know, table talk with reporters in that convention room in Orlando, that Shanahan painted himself almost into a corner, Larry, about the importance of IU in this ultra important off season for Brock Purdy, which is where we started the show, which to me, I don't think Kyle is, is, you know, blowing smoke when he's talking about the importance of, of Brock 
in a full off season. We know the coaches relish coaching moments. There is no bigger coaching moment than in an off season. So this is something that Kyle, I think, has prioritized. And I really do think that it it, it affects decisions. And I think it's, like, it's good cop, bad cop. Yeah, it's like I, Kyle's going to play the good cop. Kyle's going to play the good cop. Man, we love him. Are oh, you kidding me? We love this guy. We absolutely love him. And who's going to pay the pay the pay uh, play the bad cop? Prague. Prague's going to be like, hey, man, we just can't do that. You know, but just the way that. that he just the way that he painted himself into the how important Ayuk is for Purdy in this ultra important offseason. I just thought he, you know, Kyle's smart enough to not position himself into a statement that could then be used against him because he knows that that's the way the media works. Kyle's been in this game long enough to know that he, you know, he's not an oversharey guy. He's not a flowery complimentary guy for guys who are on the edge of contracts, under contract, don't have a contract. Like he, Kyle is light with the compliments. And I just thought that he went way out of his way to link Ayuk's presence to the importance of this off season. And when you think about it, this is the 49ers, Larry, as far as this assembled group is concerned, this is their last best chance. Well, and beyond that, beyond that, um, let's pretend that all other seasons prior to the next one don't exist because that's the way football coaches think. It's, it's not about what you did last year, two years ago, three years ago. It's literally about what are you going to do next year? And if you ask me, of all the Niner weapons, who do I feel most confident in having a big year next year? I would take Ayuk. He was, he's, you know, younger. His body's younger than Debo's. His, his whole, you know, mindset is Debo runs across the middle. Kittle's older. Debo's been, hit, you know, used very liberally. McCaffrey's coming off of a, what did, how many touches did McCaffrey have? Too many, too many. Tons. Let's just call it too many touches. Nearly four hundred or four hundred, maybe more. I didn't, I haven't looked, but a lot. So he's coming off of the, you know, a career high touch mark. Juwan is more of a, you know, um, a complimentary piece. Debo is been ridden hard and is not the same player that he was, or is was hurt at the end of the year. Kittle definitely is on the wrong side of thirty. So it's Ayuk. So Ayuk is the guy that, you know, if they're, unless they add new guys, um, if you're just going off their old guys, he's the guy that is most likely to have the big monster bust out year um, because he kind of had it last year, but he wasn't, didn't see the ball enough. And so if he sees the ball 25% more this year, he's likely to have his career year. You know, I got uh, Dale, our friend, our friend Dale, who is, you know, all over the chat on my channel, on your channel. He's a huge Niners fan, but sometimes we have to do the show just for Dale or Dale thinks we're doing it just for him. You know, he says, no, dude, the team really isn't that old. What do you mean? Last best chance other than a tight end and left tackle. It's not that old. It's got nothing to do with age. It's got nothing to do with miles on the tires. This has to do with the structure of this team. When I say last best chance, I don't mean last best chance for Kyle to ever win it. I mean last best chance for this group as it's assembled as we know it. Because as Jed York was talking to media people in uh, Orlando, one of the things that he brought up is that he expects Brock Purdy to completely reset the quarterback market. And look, if he does... It'll be because good things have happened for the 49ers. Brock Purdy in year number one loses an NFC title game. Brock Purdy year number two wins NFC title game. Brock Purdy year number three is about to unfold. If he gets better, if he takes that step forward, every 49er fan should be rooting for him to take forward. Brock Purdy is once again on the edge of the could be MVP conversation and the 49ers have had a serious degree of team success again. And that wallet opens up once Brock Purdy is commanding, you know, $40 million a year, everything else about this team is going to start changing. So it's the last best chance under this economic model, the way that this team has been assembled, as you know, it, this is it. We talked about this last year, Larry, rolling into last year, this time last year.
when well we, you're both you're both right i mean yeah. you're you're right in that they're gonna have to pay the quarterback dale's totally right in saying no dude this team is really not old because they only have like three players on the entire team that are over 30 yeah no i never so said it, old. It's, i never it's said a old. young team i never said old i never and i i my inference for last band's best shot has to do with how the cap is applied not anybody's age well, to me, then the real shot is not about anything other than this next draft. What's coming up a month from two days ago on March or on uh, April 25th, that is their <clears throat> next best shot or maybe last best shot to, you know, it's like, it's like this way. Look at it this way. The storm is coming and we're all at Costco right now. Are you, what are you going to load up with? Right. That's really it. The Niners financial storm, as you correctly assessed it is coming. They're going to have to pay their quarterback. Who knows? 25, 50, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60. I mean, a ton, a ton compared to what they're paying him. They're now loading up with groceries for the storm. That's coming at Costco. They better fucking load up. Right. They better not just buy 19 bags of, uh, of, you know, um, you know, SOS pads because that's not going to help them during this storm, but they better buy the, the kinds of things that they're going to need during the storm that the Trey Lance trade prevented them from loading up on in previous drafts. And that's where they're at. So this better be the draft where you load up on really cheap offensive linemen. So you can say, Hey, Trent, been it's been great or hey brendel we're replacing you with a rookie hey um hughes check we're replacing you with a rookie hey you know kittle we're replacing you with a rookie hey you know hargrave we're replacing you with a rookie they're gonna have to replace five or six key guys with younger players that they pulled out of the draft and since they haven't pulled a lot of them out of the draft in recent years, though I do think Jalen Graham is that player. Um, th this is it. So all these people, when you read these draft things going, you know, they really only have one need or two needs. No, actually, if you think down the road, they have lots and lots of needs and they really need to hit in this draft. And if they can, if they could, you know, if they like a player in the first round, but they like that player and he's slated to go 45 and they're picking at 31. Sure as hell. They ought to trade back a couple of times and garner extra selections and make that, make the, get the player they want and get those extra picks because those extra picks are going to help save you a year from now. If you hit on them and you know, obviously we know the reality is they're going to have to pay the quarterback. By the way, we'd like to welcome our newest sponsor, Costco SOS Pads. Oh, Larry, we just lost the sponsorship. Great uh, job. Uh, no, but uh, welcome to Wake Up with Damon and Larry. Please hit like and subscribe. Lots of news certainly coming out of Orlando. And uh, again, Jed, you know, said that he he's not disappointed by losing the Super Bowl. And of course, you know, the dumbest among us in 49er land take that and try to use it against Jed and say, well, this is a lowering of standards and Eddie D never would blah, blah, blah. And people just need to fucking chill out, dude. I mean, <laughs> good Lord. Good Lord. Well, he was also talking about it, about just, you know, how he reacted to it around his 11 year old. And he, he painted a picture where his 11 year old was distraught. So, you know what? I mean, I, I have a 14 year old, your kids are a little younger, but when your kids are distraught, you try to lift them up. And so that to me, I didn't take that. Of course, Jed has a passion to win. If he's at the facility all the time, he's involved. He's not Hasso Plattner, you know, of the sharks walking around the streets of, you know, belgrade or something you know <laughs> he, he's he, he, you know totally aloof from what the sharks are doing right. he's Has very much same in years yeah i uh, wouldn't you know wouldn't be able to tell you anything about the team jed's all in on the team 
It's just that, um, you know, he'd ra- he says, I'd rather not, you know, take, I'm not going to be ashamed of very good because we didn't get ultimate great. And that's, I think that's a mature way of looking at it. Now, some people would argue that Eddie D's singular drive and focus and maniacal approach of, you know, nothing is good enough, but victory uh, is a, is a key component of the Niners past success. I would push back on that and say, that's, that's a great story that people love to tell because it's a great story. But in reality, the Niners don't win if they don't have the players. They had the players. They had the players in many other years that they didn't win. It's just really hard to win in the NFL. So it is. And they had the players under a, a a business model that no longer exists. You know, go spend money on that used to be the way you could correct all your NFL problems. And it's not like that anymore. So um, you know, it's I do feel like it's a little apples to oranges comparison and just competing, you know, comparing any owner to Eddie DeBartolo only, you know, for like Jed York shouldn't be measured against, you know, a man who could be argued to be the greatest NFL owner of all time outside of Vince Lombardi. Um, uh, you know, he should be measured against his peers. He should be measured against the contemporary owners that he now exists among and Jed York is amongst the most successful contemporary owners in all of football. If you want to measure that by wins and losses, if you want to measure that by Super Bowl appearances and how these guys are really all running their races, they measure it by revenue. And the 49ers have increased the value of their brand on a global scale that even four or five years ago, no one could have imagined. So, I mean, again, I... I have been among the harshest Jed York critics this market has ever seen. And I'm telling you, he's doing a good job. And if I'm telling you that Jed York is doing a good job, you can do, kind of take it on face value that he is. Cause I would not just throw compliments at Jed York unless I think he's earned them. And I think he has. Well, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's a different time. You know, I mean, I think of it as players. Cause I, I look at the personnel side. There was a time where the Niners, you know what? Michael Carter's getting a little old. We better get a backup. They got Jim Burt and Fred Smurlis, and they kept all three of them. You know, what team can have three nose guards? Well, the Niners did back in the day. So, and the other thing about Jed, you know, everybody likes to talk about what Eddie did that Jed didn't do. Let's talk about what Jed did that Eddie didn't do. Jed got the stadium built. The state that the Niners' ability to compete in the free agent market is directly tied to the revenue produced by their stadium. Eddie D tried. Eddie D couldn't get it done. Jed got it done. Now, whether you like the look of it, the where it sits and this and that, it doesn't change the ultimate reality that there's a bunch of suites. People buy them. It gives the Niners a uh, revenue that they is non-shared revenue. You know, the TV contract, shared revenue. Gambling money, shared revenue. So, everybody's got the same amount of money. There's no advantage. Your advantage or lack thereof is directly tied to your stadium revenue, your signage, your suites, all that kind of stuff. And under Jed, the Niners have figured out a way to get in the game, get the stadium built, get the signage sold. Um, And so that's how you get Hargrave. That's how you get Mooney Ward. You know, that's how you get the free agents you got this year. So, you know, everybody loves the Eddie did this, but Jed didn't. Nobody really loves the Jed did this, Eddie didn't. Right. The people who talk fondest and warmest about Eddie DeBartolo weren't even born when Eddie DeBartolo won the team. You know what I mean? Like, had had the team. You don't hear old-time 49er fans, I think, coming back to this talking point as much as the Nouveau Riche thinks that, you know, they deserve – their dynasty, just like their dad had their dynasty, and that's the way I want it, and I want it immediately right now. And and you know, Kyle Shanahan's a loser. That's it's from that crowd, not from the actual understands NFL history crowd. That I think that this talking point well, comes stop from. Being, yeah, stop acting like a petulant child. Stop being. I, I'm ashamed of of a trip to the Super Bowl. Right. Yeah, do we all want to win the Super Bowl? Yeah, do is it the final frontier for Shanahan and and Jed and 
and uh, John. Well, maybe not Jed now that he's the he's the you know got the team from the parents. But it's absolutely huge for the players, the coaches, John. Uh, it's the only Kyle. thing left to do. It's yeah. they the, they have played the video game. They've played it well. They've got the high score, but they have not beaten the final boss. And that's it. The only thing left for them to do is to beat the final boss. So, but they're 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 pretty good at playing this video game outside of beating that final boss. Totally agreed. And um I think there's reason in this super pessimistic world that we live in for optimism because you do have a general manager and a head coach that are tied together. You do have a personnel department that's producing players. You do have a relatively young head coach that's considered one of the top young co- young head coaches in the league. And you do have a top young quarterback who's considered one of the top young quarterbacks in the league. So to me, the, the, the key pillars of any skyscraper that leads you to the Super Bowl has to be a GM that works, a GM and head coach that get along, a head coach that works, a head coach and quarterback that get along, an a owner that spends, a owner that spends money, and a quarterback that's good, and 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 works. Let's just say, and they've got all these, they've got the pillars in place. Now it's about, can you pick the right center? Can you pick the right D tackle? Can you pick the right corner? Can you pick the right linebacker? And and that's very much a question because. Adam Peters has moved on to uh, the commanders and we don't know what, how big or small of a role he had in their success personnel wise. We're going to find out. We're going to find out uh, in, in a month. Larry, I was told that Adam Peters only picked the players that didn't work out and all remaining Niners executives are the play are, are the guys who picked the ones that did. So there's nothing to worry about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, please like and subscribe. Thank you so much for being here this Wednesday morning. Wake up coming to you now three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We start at 830 and we will effort to get it closer to our start time. We really will. I was running a little bit late today, a little traffic jam coming back from dropping the kids off and the wife at Bart, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but we will effort uh we, we, you know I, I said we're like the band you know it might say that the show starts at 8 30 but we'll take the stage a few minutes later to build that anticipation uh that's what we're doing here but thank you very much for choosing to be with us you could go an awful lot of places for your niner news you go an awful lot of places for your morning show and you keep on coming back here and we thank you please like please subscribe we got memberships available on both these channels um the last thing a guy who looks like you, Larry, or a guy who looks like me should ever do is criticize the aging process of another man. But boy, I couldn't help but take away one of the things that I first thought, like as soon as Kyle sits down in front of that little table for his media moment, Larry, he's wearing it. He is wearing it. Kyle Shanahan looks five years older than he did just a year ago. Now, there is there are chapters in, in men's lives where the aging process, like goes over into the fast lane like between 16 and 21 boy you you go from a boy to a man then you go from like a young man into like okay now you're an adult and then all of a sudden you know you get billy joel where one day you look like you're a young kind of adult and then the next day boom you're gray as hell like for kyle it's taken two super bowl losses for me it's taken two kids i go back and look at pictures of me and jillian before Jack was born four and a half years ago. Oh my God, we look like we're at the high school prom together. I mean, there's not a that there's a maybe a tiny bit of gray here, but there's you know, it's not like freaking Wolfman Jack Gray. There's more brown up here than gray. Not only there's more of it up here than there was. I mean, just four years ago, I looked 15 years younger than I do today. Kyle Shanahan is in that same boat right now, Larry. You're holding on to your youthful good looks. I don't know how you do it, but man, oh man, Kyle Shanahan it looks just like he is. He needs a nap. I don't know if he slept since the Super Bowl. Well, I mean, this is why I'm a radio host. Right. Not that You're never meant to be you think, on camera. <laughs> you, if, you, if you think, no, well, I didn't mean that. I just meant uh, hours wise. If you think <laughs> I look bad now, Imagine how bad I would have looked if I had stayed in football. 
I had an opportunity to stay in football. I was offered a job to stay in football. I could have said no to the radio in my early days of sports byline USA and said, no, I'm going to stay with the Arizona Cardinals. I'm going to stay. I'm going to move my family. I'm going to, I'm going to chase this scouting dream. And, um, I got a glimpse of it. Um, I, I, I worked in, in the Canadian football league. I worked with the Cardinals. I, I met all their old scouts, all their old coaches, all, you know, heard their stories of woe about their old relationships or the kids that they barely know or barely see. And I said, no, that's not me. I'm not, I, I, you know, now looking back at it, I kind of wish that I had stayed with personnel because I think I would have been very high up in the personnel game, but you know what? I don't, I don't uh, regret it because I have a great wife, great kids, and I've spent a lifetime with them and raising them. And I've been there for all the, all the birthday parties and the baptisms and the first communions and right. the prom, I look at it this way. I have no idea. Pictures I, and the, I, I think you would have been a good GM, Larry, if you put and sunk all of your efforts into it and had all the tools that they had and all the help that they had to gather and dissect information. I think you do have a front office mind. But more important than that, your kids love you. <laughs> you know, your right. kids I mean, love like you. <laughs> Andy Reid is probably if if you said who's on top in the NFL world, it's Andy Reid, right? He's on top. He's the head coach of a near dynasty, if you want to call him that. Um, and look at his family. Right. I mean, he's he's a wreck. His look kids his, are a disaster. Look at his kids. That's what really matters at the end of the day. Now. I'm not saying that if you're in football, you're going to have a effed up family. I'm just saying that you're going, there's a price to be paid. That's why I don't get, I don't lead the charge against Kyle Shanahan or John Lynch. I don't, um, because I've worked those hours. And when you've worked 115 hour weeks, you know, the difference between I watched the game. Oh yeah. And I watched it a second time. Who gives a fuck? You watch it a second time. So now you've spent, instead of being spending three hours, we'll give you five, let's say maybe a couple hours of thinking about it. So instead of spending six hours, you're spending 10. These guys are spending a hundred hours more per week, analyzing every aspect of this. than the most hardcore guy who watches the game film top to bottom two full times and thinks about it another six hours. Right. Take that guy in the media or in the fan, in the world of fans and compare him to Chris Forster who got to work probably, you know, in the off season here, it's nine Oh six right now. He probably got to work five hours ago, four hours ago for sure, probably around five and he's going to be there probably until five o'clock tonight. So he's going to work like 12 hours today. And then, but this is the off season in the real season. He's going to get there at five and stay there till like eight, nine, 10. And some of these guys are going to stay till midnight and they're going to do it all again the next day. So it's just, it's a level of commitment that these guys, you know, why does Shanahan look older? Because he's working like a dog because the NFL coaches need almost like rules put in place to protect them from themselves. Well, Otherwise, like, they're just going to sit there and work. So the players, best thing that ever happened, Damon, I talked to uh, Shanahan and Lynch and a couple other people around the league that I know. Best thing that ever happened was the pandemic um, as far as the draft process, because all those draft meetings, which could easily be held virtually, were held virtually. And those guys got to spend so much more time leading up to the draft with their families than they ever did before or since. Um, and I bet you the process was pretty streamlined. And look, it's we, we've talked about how coaching is like officially bad for you. These guys, you know, they, they're they're their matches burn bright and quickly. Um, there is an uncertainty that goes with more coaching careers than there is certainty attached to coaching careers. You could lose your job. You got to move. You got to pull your family out of school, the hours you keep. And just, 
I mean, I, like you say, so Chris Forrester is about to watch eight hours of game film. In those eight hours, the only thing he's going to be looking at is ankles. Like he's going to be looking at defensive ends ankles for eight hours to see if he can figure out if his ankle lined up like this means he's going to be pass rushing or dropping back in coverage. Like they watch film in a way where they'll spend five hours just looking for flexed knuckles. How does your hand hit the dirt? Is your thumb in the ground when you're bull rushing or is your thumb off the ground? If that's going to be a spin move, like it is ridiculous. The, the amount of information that they're trying to gather and learn about to prepare for anything. They have a meeting about the football. They have a weekly meeting. That's just about the protecting the football. I mean, think about that for a second. I mean, these guys, yeah, they're, they're grinding. They're absolutely grinding and they're grinding. They're grinding all day, every day. And that's why sometimes some of them get like kind of pissy if you start to really question them because they know they're staring at a guy who made it may not have even watched the game twice and they've watched it five times. And you, you know I mean? It's like anything else. You're going to question the teacher on parent teacher conference night when she's got a master's degree and a doctorate in her topic. And you just have kind of a passing interest and saw something on TV the other night. I mean, you know, just like the way that people started questioning the medical community. You know, you couldn't even tell me what's in toothpaste, much less a vaccine, and you use toothpaste every day. But on this issue, you're an entomologist? Come on. Well, but the only thing on that is that, you know, who's what are the pressure points there? Who's controlling what? Is it big business? I mean, there's there's also some, you know, uh, I think it's been kind of proven at this point that there's you know, there's some concerns over whether or not uh, that thing was a, a great thing for everybody, but whatever it's, 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 uh, you know, it, it's, it's questioning somebody who knows a lot more about it. And some of those people actually had, you know, were, were influenced by people that had a big business. I, oh, I own Pfizer stock. So I, I, you know, I saw the stock soar, um, but there's no stockholder that's telling the 49ers, you know, you need to work this hard. It's just them being competitive and wanting to win. So it's, it's really, and then there's all kinds of, the other thing I, I learned when I was uh, working in pro football is that coaches spend a lot of time on the phone. Why do they spend a lot of time on the phone? Because as you said, Damon, a lot of these guys are going to get shit canned at the end of the year. And so you have to have, you gotta, you gotta do a good job of networking with the other people that you know in football and so guys are calling guys all the time. Well, what's going on there? Yeah, well, they're going to hire this guy, but they're going to hire an internal guy because they've brought in three guys. You know, so everybody's looking for a job. I mean, not everybody. I would say 85% of the coaches are coaching and looking for a job, their next job. 15% of them are so skilled and so great at what they do, they can just coach, and then another job will appear for them. But the rest of the rank and file sit around and call my. I got to call my buddy from 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 Tulsa. Yeah, no, he's the DB coach now for the Titans. Yeah, I got to check in with him and find out if he can get me a gig next year if things don't work out here. You know, it's like so. There's a lot of that too. So the other thing that I thought Larry came out of Kyle Shanahan's table talk down in Orlando was a little more clarity as to the hierarchy between. Um, Brandon Staley and, you know, Nick Sorensen, who Kyle Shanahan basically said, um, you know, he's worked with a lot of people before us that I knew. I knew him up in Seattle being in Jacksonville, his playing career where our paths crossed a number of ways and having him in our building the last couple of years, getting to work with D'Amico, getting to work a ton with Steve, like last year really prepared him for this moment. And it sounds like, you know, the key word here is just familiarity. Not only Sorensen's familiarity with the building, but with Kyle's style and how he wants it done. And he's a little versatile and maybe open to a few new ideas, which is why Brandon Staley is in the building. It sounds like Brandon Staley is going to be Kyle Shanahan's game plan midweek install, kind of extra set of eyes on everything. And then on game day, Sorensen you know, really takes over as the defensive coordinator and Staley is, well, I don't know if he's going to be on or off microphone, 
but it, it sounded an awful lot like Staley is a guy who is going to oversee big picture things defensively. And then Sorensen being the defensive coordinator is going to be your game day play caller and a little bit more hands-on game plan, game coach. Sounds like the difference between Brandon Staley and Nick Sorensen. Sorensen's the DC. He'll call the defense. I thought it was the most interesting line from Shanahan yesterday was our players love him. They're used to him. That's why he got the job. Uh, the players like him and they're used to him. And they like their scheme and they don't want to. I, I think this is the healthiest, um, the healthiest approach to go with Sorensen. The more I think about it. Why? Because, you know, Steve Wilkes was an outsider who was brought in. The rest of the staff was in place. So he was an outsider to the players, to the coaches, and he had to adapt. And now it's like you've got a guy who's not an outsider. You've got a guy who's an insider. You've got a guy who the players know and like. You've got a guy who the coaches know and like. There'll be no fall guy. There'll be no excuses. There'll be no anything. Um, Sorensen is the guy. So I, I think that's a healthier deal than bringing in a really talented guy and saying, oh, that's your linebacker coach. That's your secondary coach. That's your D-line coach. This is your defense. Learn it all. And by the way, the buck stops with you. Well, you know, does it really? Or am I like the one new teacher at a school where the students are the same and the rest of the teachers are all the same and I'm the new person and right. anything that anything bad that happens gets blamed on me. And there's all these people that have these relationships as far as what Staley's role is going to be. I think he's going to be part of building the plan. I think it sounds like Shanahan made it sound like he's he's big on personnel. So maybe he's the reason they got Leonard Floyd. I mean, if if all the Niners did this year was add in the offseason was add Leonard Floyd, who I think is the best um, defensive end they've had opposite Bosa. If that's all that Staley contributes, that might be enough. It might be enough. Just to just to identify and uh, you know Leonard Floyd and get his name on the dotted line. Leonard Floyd, I think, is better than D Ford. I think he's better than Chase Young. I think he's better than Randy Gregory. He's a ten sack a year guy. He's got special gifts. He's got a crazy motor. Just getting Leonard Floyd. Um, if that was what Staley did, was a great addition. We got some rule changes to talk about. There are some things and wrinkles that we haven't seen before. We've got some scheduling to talk about. Welcome. It's good to have you here on Wake Up. Damon and Larry, please like and subscribe on both of these channels. And uh, before we get to that, Larry, just one more quick note on this very important offseason for Brock Purdy. What do you think the most important offseason thing for Brock Purdy is to do or to work on or to learn about? What is, do you think, Kyle Shanahan's priority list for Brock Purdy's offseason? What do you think it looks like? And that is a great freaking question. Um, what is the most important thing for Brock Purdy's offseason? I, I actually think, you know, he knows the offense. I think it's pretty pretty clear, right? I mean, he he looked good in the Super Bowl. Um, the kid's got married now. He's got a lovely bride, and and he seems very very happy. So he's got the home life taken care of. I think it's really about improving his athleticism from Tom. You know the way that Tom Brady improved his, and the way that many pros improve theirs. They're you know living in a dorm eating dorm food, having a bunch of beers, living on campus. Then they step into an NFL locker room and they're like, whoa, these guys are for real. Then they set into a, they get with the nutritionist and they get with the, 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 you know, the strength and conditioning coach. And they realize, wow, I can really improve. I think Brock Purdy can improve his athleticism, his arm strength, how sudden he is, how quick he is, how explosive he is by just doing you know, drills and lifting and dieting and doing everything the right way. I think you're going to see in, in training camp, a guy who's more explosive than ever, uh, faster than ever, greater arm strength than ever. All the things that are physical, I think he can improve upon 
in this off season. And I think he can show up um, in July as like, wow, look at Brock, man. He's moving great. He's throwing great. His arm strength looks better than ever. He's never looked better kind of a thing. And I think it's all tied to his body and, and developing his body and his athleticism. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 you and I, we sort of think alike when we look at things and my, my answer was going to be arm strength. Not that he's got a weak arm, but just arm strength and accuracy, particularly when throwing outside the numbers way downfield, the, the Danny gray rumor has to become an actual threat, not just a rumor. But the, and it doesn't even need to be Danny Gray. But what Danny Gray was supposed to represent the I take the lid off, I take your you know I I make you worry about deep shots have to be more of a conceptual worry and an actual threat. And that's Brock throwing deep downfield. And you know I'm not accusing him of dinking and dunking at all, Larry. Uh, but I, I if you're asking me what's the one component that Brock would be even more dangerous at. Cause I do think he's accurate. He is really good. You know, 15 yards and in it's the, it's the deep ball attack. It's really threatening other teams with that. And you need the white, the right wide receiver to do that. And again, that brings us back to Brandon Ayuk, which is where this entire discussion started about 40 minutes ago. And just the two of them in an off season together and get Debo in and get Kittle in and get, you know, Christian McCaffrey in and get Danny Gray in and get Ronnie Bell in and get every guy, you know, at San Jose State working out together on their free time. Like it's up to you guys now. You are loaded. You have a really good football team. If these offseason moves, if just a few of them hit, this defense should be better. And that means this offense, you're at 30 points a game all year long. You're going to have another really good year. You're going to have another one seed flirtation. And that's where they want to be. That's what they got to do. I mean, build, build, build your fortress. You know, some teams build the fortress and then add the quarterback. Some teams add the quarterback and then build the fortress. The Niners are in that situation. They have the quarterback. They've got a great left tackle, a very good left guard, and replacement player level center, right guard, and right tackle. And I love Colton McKivitz, and I and I think Shanahan. That was the other kind of takeaway from Shanahan. He, he you know he talked about McKivitz, and people are saying you know basically pointing the the finger at McKivitz, and he said, hey, he's done a hell of a job for us at right tackle. He's one of the leaders on the team. You know, um, so he obviously feels better about McKivitz than most rank and file 49er followers do. But what about right guard? You got John Feliciano, you got Burford, a fourth round pick who's trying to find his way. What about center? You had Jake Brendel, who anybody could have had. He was a street free agent. Um, he got worked bad by DJ Reader in the Bengal game. I mean, DJ Reader just threw him around. So to me, um, there's an awesome center in this draft. His name is Zach Frazier, and he played at West Virginia just like uh, McKivitz. I think I would go draft Zach Frazier. And then there's two incredible offensive linemen, I think, at South Dakota State. One is a guy named Mason McCormick, and the other is his counterpart, Garrett Greenfield. If you can come away from the draft with Zach Frazier, Mason McCormick, and Garrett Greenfield, you will have built your fortress of of the future around Brock Purdy and then let Forrester and, and uh, you know, powers that be decide who's the best players to play as the season goes on. My guess is Frazier would take Brendel's job before week one that McCormick would take over probably in the, in four or five weeks and that Greenfield would probably be ready to take over by next year. So that that's my guess. That's, that's how I would go about it. I mean, you still need other pieces. I think you need a deeper D line. You need a linebacker. You need some safety help. I mean, you could always use a great player at any position, so on and so forth. They should go best player available a lot, but they got to build their fortress and they got to invest in two or three offensive linemen that they love, that they, they absolutely think are going to be the key figures on this team going forward. And then they got to hit, they got to make sure they draft those guys. They got to develop them, get them on the field. 
I mean, to me, that's that's first and foremost. You know, you Brock Purdy's not the biggest guy. You have to protect Brock Purdy better than they did this year. And if they do, I think, you know, what you're talking about, it's funny, we're talking about the same thing, really. You're talking about more of a downfield attack, Danny Gray, this and that. Well, guess what you got to do if you're going to throw it down the field? You got to protect. <laughs> yeah, you got to protect. And, and, and it comes first. So um, that, to me, is it. You got to find a way. To me, there's 10 to 15 really great offensive linemen in this draft. You got to get two or three of them. Simple as that. So the other thing that you're going to have to get is a special teams coordinator who quickly adjusts to the new hybrid kickoff rule that the NFL approved. By the way, Jed York was a dissenting vote. He did not vote for the new hybrid kickoff, which is now going to be part of the NFL. Um, it's almost a little bit too complicated to explain where it is all on the field. You can look at the graphics. There are plenty of them out there. You can look at highlights from like the inaugural season of the XFL. Um, a guy named Sam Schwartenstein, who was a big XFL uh, thinker, was an offensive lineman at Stanford, um, is a guy who's now working with like Thursday night football. This was sort of his idea and it produced quite a bit of action. And in 400 documented instances of this, no injury. So, you know, they're touting it as a safer way. And as you know, Larry, as I've totally demonstrated sometimes with you even yelling at me, I really, you know, player safety is not my priority. It's not. I'm sorry. I'm not here for the safest game of football you can offer me. I've never been interested in that. I would like a moratorium on any and all rule changes. This is a league that spends way too much time tinkering with a rule book that's already an inexact science in every offseason. But I actually kind of, and I fear change. I hate change. I don't like differences. I actually think that this new hybrid kickoff rule is going to be, if you're opposing it now, I think it'll be welcome by the time you see it and get used to it. I think it'd be something that people will like. Because really, what you're doing in this new kickoff rule is running a stretch play that gives the return man the running head start more than it does the defense trying to tackle him. I think it's going to breed action, Larry. I think it. I think the NFL might have gotten this one right. Well, as you know, as I said before, um, you know, I used to work in in the Canadian league, and then the Canadian league. You, there is, you can be moving forward behind the line of scrimmage um, at the snap and you can time it. So you can get a three yard running start and it's a huge factor. Huge. If I'm flat footed and you've got a running start, it's a huge factor advantage me. So it will be a huge factor advantage returner, which will me mean there'll be scores. I think it really emphasizes that um you've got to me i think this is a you know obviously you got to your special teams coach has got to know the rules okay that's that's an obvious but it's really more about can you find the player that is likely to excel in this role and to me it's it's likely to be either somebody with a lot of speed or somebody who can translate power to speed so like Terrell Owens didn't have a ton of speed, but he could translate power to speed. And that's what I'd be looking for here. Well, the guy the who can Steelers. who can get three steps and all of a sudden it's like nobody wants to bring that guy down. The Steelers just signed Cordero Patterson. The guy who was, you know, sort of the in-between guy. I'm kind of a running back. I'm kind of a return guy. I'm kind of a a wide receiver, what you know, what you are as a football player. I think this play will lend itself to teams looking for football players who might be overlooked in a normal return game, but this is going to be a little bit different. I, I think that there's a lot of tricks that can be baked into this. Um, some people on the chat are rightfully asking, what does this mean for the onside kick? It means less of it. It means no surprise onside kick. And there's an old part of my football soul that says, well, that can be a big surprise, that play. The surprise onside kick 
is such a less than single digit infinitesimal part of our football consumption that I don't think that we need to like lament its passing as, you know, this, this great friend that is no longer with us. You know, it was an interesting option that was so rarely used. You could go several seasons in between actually seeing and happening. This I think is going to create football action on a play that had basically been reduced to a ceremonial touchback with these kickers putting everything, you know, out of the back of the end zone. I think right. it's going to bring more it, action. It, it went from a dangerous play to a non-play. Well, you can't have a non-play, okay? So that doesn't work. It's why they um, moved the point after touchdown back because that became so automatic that why don't we just give touchdowns? Why do, why do we even bother with this? superfluous every kicker hits it point after touchdown what are we doing they're like well let's make it a little more interesting we're going to move it back and now it's not just the chippy that is the gimme and it has made scores more interesting well you want to make the game more interesting Niners would have won a super bowl this year had that not happened by the way I'll, i'll i'll make the game more interesting eliminate the pat and everybody has to go for two now the game's way more interesting now it's like this team is in fourth place and they've lost seven games in a row, but they lead the NFL in two point conversions and everybody knows it. Why? Because they've got a play or a timing mechanism or something. Some two players are in lockstep or they've got a play call. It would add intrigue and interest. What if it was the brotherly shove? Oh, you'd hate it then. Yeah, I mean the PATs right now. I mean it's it's come on. Even short field goals at this point, they're kind of gimmies. Um, I'd like to see, you know, I'd like to see the play brought back as far as you know the special teams play, the kickoffs, and I'd love to see it be made safer, but not eliminated. And to me, there's a couple guys in the draft like. You mentioned that the Raiders or the Steelers signed Cordero Patterson. The Niners supposedly had a huge contingent of people at Western Kentucky's pro day to look at Malachi Corley. Well, it's pretty easy to envision Malachi Corley being the guy who is, you know, as you're bringing him along, your major return guy. Uh, I'm a big fan of Blake Corum, the, the Michigan running back. Well, I mean, I think Blake Corum could be a freaking awesome return guy. You know, another guy, he's a, you said he's a football player. He's a football player. He's 5'7", yeah. he's 215, um, but he's quick and he's got cutting ability and he's a, you know, he's a big time player. So guys who have a little bit of speed and a little bit of heft, I think could be in vogue. Um and absolutely how do you run in space how do you run in space can you hit holes can you make your own hole can you get through hole i mean like it's i i think that the new hybrid kickoff will like with all change have its early dissenters and then by the middle of the season everyone's going to be like all right this is great you know i'm I, i come back from the bathroom by the time the commercial's over because these kickoffs aren't just ceremonial touchbacks now i think that um, I think it's going to be good. Now I might be wrong. I might be wrong, but you know, I, I hated the wild card until I learned how much more interesting it made baseball season at the end of baseball seasons. And as much as I hated Bud Selig, I had to admit he got that one, right? Let's see if the and NFL then they also, got, right. and they also put a runner at second base and I hate that. Got, yeah. That's just a train wreck. Having said um, that, Larry, nothing makes me turn a baseball game on faster than extra innings, man on second, nobody out. Like, I will go check out the game I wasn't watching when I see it's an extras. So I might hate it, but I keep on falling for it. So I'll say that, too. Yeah, I mean, but you could bastardize any game. And and you, you know what? We're eliminating NBA overtime. We're just going to put one person at the foul line, and uh, they're going to shoot a free throw. And if they make it, the, it's game over. Well, great. Yeah. Are we all going to gather around watching that jackass at the foul line? Yeah, we are. But it doesn't mean it's good. It just means we're all watching it. But I, I, I hear what you're saying. But like, give you an example. Xavier Worthy for Texas ran 4-2-1. But he weighs 165 pounds. That guy, even though he's a burner in this return thing, 
he'll have an advantage, but he's still, you know, if you can get a finger on him, he's going to go to the ground. The guy who's going to have a real advantage is the guy who like Xavier Leggett, who's like 6'3", 230. And if he's got, you know, two, three, four ste- steps of steam, you know, good luck bringing that guy down. Well, you know so, who, who's the number one candidate for being great at this at the 49ers? It's Debo. I mean, yeah. this is this sounds like it's made for Debo Samuel. So if he's healthy, absolutely. A um, couple of other things and just pieces of news here. Uh, trade deadline has been pushed back to week nine now, Larry. You know, NFL trade deadline when we were kids, we didn't make much of it. Nothing really happened. It was baseballs, it was basketballs, and the NFL didn't do much. We're seeing teams become more aggressive at trade deadlines, and now they're going to have a week to think even more about who they might be. I think that's good for NFL business. And like all I would have NFL- pushed it back even further. I mean, really? think about it. Yeah, because there, we how many weeks of football are there? 17? Yeah. Well, shouldn't it be like around week 10 then? I mean, that's a lot of, that's a lot. I mean, look at it this way too. There's no, it's like walking across a desert without a canteen. I mean, let's let these guys have the canteen later in the walk so that we get a higher quality of, of dialogue and, uh, you know, into and out of the trade deadline. And we get teams that are really utilizing it for their advantage. I want to see teams utilize it for their advantage who are in it and i want to see teams utilize it for to their advantage when they're out of it and it seems to me one week doesn't do that much i would have pushed it back two or three weeks then at least you know hey you know what we're the atlanta falcons but somehow amazingly you know we're uh eight and three uh let's get that extra player and go for it this year um, I think that's that that would be cool. Instead, now you're, you know, you're doing it earlier and teams are going to I don't think teams are going to be, you know, I don't think there's going to be teams going, oh, you know what? We got to have a guy. The other thing is there's so much so many injuries in the NFL that what happens if you get a, you know, so if somebody goes down week one through week, what week did you say it's going to be nine, nine? Yeah, so you get two months of football for somebody to go down that you need to replace. And then there's the trade deadline. And then you play another of two months of football before the playoffs for the most part. How about have it closer towards Thanksgiving? Like maybe November, you know, November or something like that. Um, why? Because then at least you're, you know, you pick up a guy, you could say, hey, you know what? We're in this thing or we're out of this thing and we're moving, we're moving guys. Right. Too and often, we, I think it, teams get caught in between. They're like, well, we're, it sends the wrong message because we're not out of it, but we're probably not going anywhere, but we don't want to trade anybody because it sends a bad message to our fans that we're out of it. Well, you know, I kind of agree, but if you push it back a few weeks and the season becomes the narrative of the season becomes more defined, then it's like, Hey fans, we were, you know, very much out of it. Uh, we only had a mathematical chance of, of being in it. And now we're getting an extra second round pick because we moved player X, who's a free agent at the end of the year. So, it's I mean, it's easier to trade your cleanup hitter when you're 18 games back. Right. I mean, and also the message that it sends to the fans, because it does send a message like, hey, we're not in it. But um, most fans love their team so much that they're okay trading some player who's a free agent at the end of the year for a second or a third round draft choice. And they can go deferred gratification if it's reasonable. You know, don't give up on the season in April or, you know, don't give up on the season in week two. It's really part of the NFL's can never be even competed with interest cycle because they have sold the draft being so important that so much can happen. And rightfully so, because it is important and so much can happen. But they've sold it to so much fan interest that, you know, the opposite of, you know, fuck them picks (laughs) that the L.A. Rams were operating under, you know, screw them picks. Turns into screw those players, get me those picks for some fans. So the NFL is just genius when it comes to 
keeping people leaning into the teams that they care about and doing brisk business over the television. And Larry, business will be a booming this upcoming holiday for the NFL. Have you seen that their success on Christmas Day last year has led to them to schedule two Christmas Day games this coming year? And Christmas is a Wednesday. And we're going to get a week of football that is going to serve us up two Christmas Day games on December 25th, a Wednesday. December 26th will be Thursday night football. Friday, we won't have football, but then Saturday, because we're approaching the end of the year, we'll have a couple of NFL games. Sunday, you'll have your normal NFL remaining slate. Then you're going to get at least uh, on the 31st of December, you're getting college football quarterfinals. And on January 1st, more college football quarterfinals on a traditional bowl game day as it is. That's like a, a, a week of football where you get six days of just sexy, important football. Uh, you're not even going to need to invite your family over for Christmas. The NFL's coming over. Set a table for the NFL. You know, and, and it does make the games more memorable. I mean, I if you said to me, think up some individual games you saw this year. One of the most memorable ones I saw this year was Dolphins Cowboys. Why? Because I'm at my sister's house. It's Christmas Eve. We're all sitting there as a family watching this random NFL game. Um, but when you put it on a holiday, it makes it better. And it's basically just saying to the NBA. playing the Ravens. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, it says to the NBA, you know. Hey, thanks for the idea. Now get the hell out of our way. You know what I mean? Look, the, really... NBA, the NBA should see when these two time slots are for the NFL. Put one game before these games kick off and one games after these games kick off, and that's your shot of having any attention on you now, NBA. The NBA should give most of its teams Christmas Day off now to spend with your family, guys, because you're going to be playing up against a ratings juggernaut. We cannot beat. There's no amount of Steph Curry, LeBron James, the NBA could ever throw at the NFL to compete with the NFL. So they should just punt. They really should. The Adam Silver, I think, is going to look at this thing and say, all right, instead of getting a million articles about how we can't compete with the NBA, we're better off punting and and loading up with Friday night games. That, that, that one day of the week where football is kind of dark, that should be the NBA's new holiday focus afternoon or evening of NBA games to get some attention to the league. Larry, how do you order a cheesesteak in Portuguese? I don't know. I don't speak Portuguese. Well, the Eagles better because they're playing week one in Brazil. They're going to be opening up in Brazil. Oi, tutu bang, uh, which is all the Brazil that I know. Because I did, I dated a really beautiful Brazilian woman for like 15 minutes of my life. They were a great 15 minutes. Um, oi, tutu 15 bang. minutes, that's quite the date. Yeah, yeah. Um, oi, tutu bang is basically how you say, hey, how you doing in Brazil? And oi, tutu bang sounds so much better than, hey, how you doing? So I just, I remembered that. That's the only thing I remember. What does it um, actually uh, mean? It means like, hey, how are you? Oh, okay. That's it. It's just, it's, it, sound, it, it, it sounds kind of. Oi, tutu bang. Sounds like I was telling you about my 15-minute Brazilian girlfriend there for a second, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh that's how you gotta that's how you gotta say, hey, how you doing in, in Portuguese. Well, and uh, and it, that that game, by the way, is gonna be exclusively on Peacock, which is a phrase you better get used to, football fans. Exclusively on Peacock is coming for you. So yeah. you might want to be ready for that. That's kind of annoying. It's like why, why, you know, why can't you just have it on Peacock and, you know, transition for five years and then make everybody, there's all these people going, I don't want Peacock. I don't want these streaming services, whatever. Uh, I will say this though, as, as, about the NFL internationally, I think the NFL should really go heavy international. Um, there's enough games. There's enough meaningless games, you know, to have the and if you really think about it, American sports outside of the premiership is easily the most compelling entertainment on the globe. 
whether you're talking about, um, you know, Major League Baseball, the NBA, uh, our our most in our most popular sport by far is football. So whatever our most popular sport is, is going to be a hit internationally because it's visually very, very compelling. And to me, if you're the NFL, if you really want to do the best you can do to grow your pie, your merchandising, everything, your awareness of your sport is to play more international games and more uh, markets. And, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is. I mean, um, I would do it. You know what I'm doing here? I am pointing towards South America, Larry, South, the oceans, Europe, very sexy, going to Asia, Japan, something like that. Very sexy, but now you're dealing with time changes and time differences. And ooh. one game though, Mexico City, Mexico. There it is. There it is. They're going to Brazil. They're going to Me- they. I think the NFL starting to figure it out. The have you ever ever met a single Spanish? Mexican person in your life that didn't have an interest in some sport. I haven't. I've yet to meet that person. I'm sure they're out there. Just haven't met them yet. That is a sports crazy country full of guys and gals who already check the I like the NFL box. Start serving it to them and give them a skip. Give them a team. If the NFL ever expands, they should have one team in Mexico, period. That's it makes too much sense. I, I disagree on that because now you're asking somebody who, you know, grew up in Manhattan, Kansas to decide to live internationally, which is a big difference. Hey, what happened to, to what, what, what you gotta you, you gotta live in Toronto? You just got drafted by the Raptors. What's the difference? Yeah, but it because those teams will will probably um operate at, at a at a negative flow as far as free agency, they won't be able to sign as many free agents because there will be fewer people that will be willing to commit to living all year round. What I would be more in tune with would just be, you're right, have a regular game in these places. So if you want to be a season ticket holder, be a season ticket holder and you're getting an NFL game every week. And then, as the as global travel becomes faster with bullet trains and faster planes and you know over the course of time then you can say hey we're just going to fly we're just going to fly it only takes x amount of time to get there we're going to take a bullet train it only takes this amount of time to get there once you land over here you know i mean once you can kind of make the the travel less difficult I think that makes sense, but I think it makes sense right now to have a team in London every single week. Why? Because from my fan, my friends who live in London, they'll say, Hey, you know what? Um, you know, who loves American football even more than people from London or people from Germany. And there there's tons of people who make this trek from Germany to London for all these NFL games. Great. Then have a game in London, maybe have a game in Germany, have a game, grow your fan base. And they're, they're doing it. I mean, you'll see it and come draft Go to a game in Barcelona, go to Spain. Sure. Absolutely. But I mean, on like draft day, they'll have the Niners will have one of their picks announced from London. They'll have one of their picks announced from, from Mexico city. Um, and, and the Niners are on the, on the cutting edge of this really. Um, they're on the, at the forefront. The Niners might be the NFL's most popular international team. They were you know marketed we aggressively in London and in Mexico City. And when the Niners played the Cardinals in Mexico City, ninety percent of the crowd were Niner fans, and it was I a Cardinal home game. Three most like biggest three international teams in the NFL are the 49ers, the Cowboys, and the Raiders. The Raiders are bigger outside of the city they've occupied than the city they've occupied. And that was true in Oakland, Los Angeles, and in Las Vegas, the Raiders have this huge global brand. I saw two NFL jerseys in my European vacation. I mean, I saw a 49er Jersey within 30 seconds of being 
in Paris. I saw well, the, the Niners have have leaned into it forever. They yeah. went to Japan early on. They, you know, they've they've played games in London. They've played games in Mexico City. They've embraced it, and they've mar- and now the NFL, as of two years ago, is marketing uh, individual teams to these markets. So it's kind of like it's like a race for merchandising dollars at this. Yeah. Point. Yeah, absolutely it is. By the way, I got to give full shout out here to Bronson in the chat who came up with maybe the single most clever response of the morning. It says, "Oi, tutu bang bang niner gang." <laughs> 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 Very good. If they ever get a game in Brazil, that should be the Portugal the the, the Portuguese battle cry. Oi, tutu bang bang niner gang. <laughs> Very good, Bronson. Dale, Very Dale good. says, "With all that being said, I hate international games." I don't. I think it's interesting. You know what? Um, I used to not like international games because they started so early in the morning, like kickoff at 6 a.m. West Coast time. And then I had kids and then I had kids dragging my ass out of bed on on weekends at 6 a.m. And all of a sudden that Titans Chargers game that I would not have given a fuck about is the only thing on. And thank God it's on. And I do watch. So there you go. I mean, there's so many ways they can play with this to make this fine for fans. Okay, so you show it early. Maybe how about this? The game that you show early, you put on NFL Network as soon as the rest of the games are over. So now you get two. You get you get two showings of your game. You get the one that's you know early morning, and then you got the one that they reshow you literally. You know as soon as uh, their post game show is over after the night game. I mean, you, there's ways to do this, but m- more than anything. If you're the NFL, you're trying to grow your pie. That's the best way to do it. I mean, just have a game. You know, if you want to be a season ticket holder for the NFL in London, you're a season ticket holder. You're not going to get the same team. But guess what? They might like, you know, maybe they don't want the same team. Maybe they want, um, you know, a a series of teams that they can watch and decide for themselves who they like. It's actually kind of cool if you think about it. Imagine... So the the stadia over in Europe are incredible, right? They've got these incredible stadiums and you basically pick a couple of stadiums and then you just rotate games, new teams every week. Like I would be more interested in buying, I think a season ticket to that than just one team. If I were living over abroad, like give me the menagerie of the entire league coming through instead of giving me, eight Jacksonville Jaguar games. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And if you want to, you want to grow your sport, I mean, take some of these other things. I mean, if you want to bring back the pro bowl, have a pro bowl, play it there. You want to bring, you want to have the senior bowl instead of playing it in mobile, Alabama, play it internationally. Dude, you guys, um, had, you, you guys didn't even want to f- fly to Hawaii for the Pro Bowl. They didn't even want to go to Miami when they moved it there. So you put yeah, that you thing in London, spend, nobody's going. <laughs> but yeah, but I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Incentivize people. I mean, you know, more than anything. But there's all kinds of things you could do to help market your sport over over internationally. And and once you've got these fans, the, since American football is so much more visually compelling than almost all the sports they're used to watching they're going to be fans for life. They're going to be huge fans. I could see a day where the NFL football is, is great, has greater popularity internationally than it does in domestically because they're, you know, here we're, we've got so many other things there, they're that this is the best they've got and they're loving it and they're supporting it at a level that's greater than the level that's being supported here. It could happen easily. I'm uh I'm all out of stuff that I needed to talk about today. I have gone through this list. I have. I, I think we've completed everything. Have we missed anything today, Larry? Um. Well, there is a story out saying that Dre Greenlaw is unlikely to be ready for week one, but anybody with a brain knew that. He suffered a torn Achilles in the Super Bowl. He's not going to be ready for week one. I mean, Shocker. hopefully he's ready to start you know, getting ready in week one to show up in week four. But yeah, that is a, that's the ultimate kissed by God, fast tracking um, of, of any recovery. 
But who knows? I mean, he's 27. Let's see how it goes. Maybe he's a quick healer. We'll find out. How about the fact that Dre Greenlaw's Achilles wasn't the only one popped in the Super Bowl and defensive backs coach Daniel Bullock's when he started jumping to celebrate the Jair Brown, Patrick Mahomes interception pulled his Achilles too, to the point where he had a surgery and is in re recovering right now and could hardly walk at the end of the game. So two non-contact Achilles injuries for the 49ers in the Super Bowl, Larry, you know, it's not going to be your day when, right? Yeah. I would say the other major story that I think probably should be followed is that if you look closely at the Niner depth chart, you're going to see that they've got a massive hole at safety. I mean, Hafonga's coming off an ACL. Jair Brown was a rookie. They don't have any backups. George Odom is a special teamer strictly. Eric Harris and Taylor Hawkins are, are you know, those guys are, are practice squad guys. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk that the Niners are looking at safeties. Uh, Julian Blackman visited. Um, you know, they're talking about Justin Simmons. And can I others. give you can I give you my safety pick from Iowa? Cooper DeGene. He might be a corner. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, you know, he's a good player. I'll give you another one for a guy that was cut the other day by the Arizona Cardinals, who is a good guy and would be a good Niners signing, I think, would be Quant Quantrez Knight, the former uh Niner, former Bruin who, you know, got plucked off the Niner practice squad by Arizona, and then they just cut them loose like two or three days ago. Um, they need to get somebody before the draft that can play safety. Otherwise, they're going to have to go safety much earlier in the draft to make sure they get what they want because they're, they need it. They, you got to have, I would say you want to have like six safeties um going into camp why because guys get hurt guys throw their bodies around you know they're gonna have brown noah fonga odom eric harris and Ty and taylor hawkins so i mean they're gonna have literally one starting safety one special teamer two practice squad guys they badly need a safety and um we'll see we'll see who they get but i expect they'll get somebody before camp before before a month from now, before the draft started. They were, it sounded like they, they were talking with what Julian Blackman, who came off uh, the Colts season and is met with the 49ers. And I think I saw Kyle Shanahan basically say, you know, that they would give him a, a chance to compete, but they're not going to sign him with any promises to be a starter, which sounds like maybe that was a condition of Julian Blackman being interested in coming to the 49ers. So I don't know if that spigot is still going to, have water running through it or for just got shut off by Kyle saying we ain't guaranteeing you a starting job. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, as the season off season progresses, team guys will have to decide, but this is where your agent comes in. This is where, if you got a good agent who can count bodies and he can sit there and go, well, wait a second. If you go to the Niners, Hafonga may not start week one. You have no competition right now. If you're Julian Blackman, who has a corner background. He used to play corner. He would be their free safety. Um, you could sign with the 49ers and you would probably be the starter week one, barring either some miraculous recovery by a Fonga or some super high investment in the draft at safety. I don't think either are going to happen. So, you know, it's like, do you want an opportunity to start on a, on a, and, and maybe an opportunity to win a Super Bowl? How many guys, how many opportunities are there out there where you could have both at once? You could have an opportunity to start and a chance to win a ring. So I, I would say the Niners are sitting in a pretty good spot. Like and subscribe to both of these channels, and that way you will never miss a thing happening on either one of these channels. If you hit notify, you'll be... You'll, you'll know when we get going, whether we're a few minutes late or not, whenever it happens. If you hit that notify button, that little bell button, it tells you when Larry and I are going to be up Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, 8.30 a.m. West Coast time is when Wake Up begins, and it is the morning show that is taking over, not just the Bay, because the Internet's bigger than that. It's the whole damn football universe, Larry. What do we got in starred Super Chats? What do we got? What have, uh, what have folks wanted to talk about? Well, we got three supers and three star damn golds or dusty gold says, damn, 
just think if Larry was on the coaching or in the front office of the Niners, we could have gotten a third round compensation pick for him. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Dale drops this super. He says, please explain arm strength. I don't, I don't ask this as an a-hole or sarcastically. I'm honestly confused about this metric. Is it how hard or how far you throw? Um, a little bit of both. Really. It is. It, it, it's both. And it's also, I think, speaking to just, you know, you building out your physique for the pounding that the NFL gives any and all quarterbacks, just stronger, more accurate, faster release, better touch. And no matter how strong or weak of an arm any quarterback has ever had, there's never a phrase that I return to more often than Steve Young just saying, throw a catchable football. So work on football catchability. If that's, that, that's probably, uh, uh, you know, way too, uh, broad and wide open to not have people laughing at oh, you work on your football catchability, Damon. Thanks an awful lot. I'm going to fucking click on your channel, but it's the truth. Steve young insists the catchable football is the best football that can be delivered. And I think maybe you throw a more catchable football with an even stronger arm. So I think that's what we mean. Well, I mean, and it's not just arm strength. I mean, it's, it's what you can do to manipulate the football. So, one of the best quarterback prospects in this draft is Michael Penix. Michael Penix has 11 and a half inch hands. He has a huge hand, so he can control the football easier. He can pump fake it and bring it back while it's in one hand. Um, you know, Brett Favre had enormous hands. Russell Wilson has enormous hands. Hey, look how Brock, look how poorly Brock performed this year with a wet football. Not that that's a criticism of hand size, but just, you know, there you go. Then there's requisite arm strength. Like, can you make all of the throws? Can you make a throw where you stick a deep out from the far hash in a tight box and get it there and really zip it out to the sideline? Or do you have to step into your throw? It's like, you know, arm strength is also about how much or how little body do you have to put into each throw? But then there's a guy like Joe Milton who's coming out of Tennessee who threw, you know, at Tennessee's pro day he threw a pass 90 yards in the air, 90. Um, he stood on his own 10 and he threw it and it landed on the goal line. So, I mean, he's got unbelievable arm strength, but it's not only about that. He's probably going to go in the fifth round because arm strength means something, but it just not, doesn't mean everything. Right. Then you got Kyle Bowler who's throwing from his knee at right. uh, Memorial stadium. And the best thing was like, well, you know, once your knee goes down, you're down. You can't throw the ball anymore. So what good is that? And so right. sometimes, arm, sometimes arm strength is uh, a mirage that suggests this quarterback can be something, but it is a prerequisite. I mean, you to be an NFL quarterback, you got to hit every route on that route tree, and you need to be. I mean, look at it this way: you got to be at least Brock Purdy on day one to have I mean, any shot at all in this league. I would say. The, the best way, since we're talking about arm strength, the best way to determine if a guy's got a requisite arm strength and enough to play in the NFL is did he win in college? Because if he won in college, he probably had to make all the throws. If he had to make all the throws, he probably will be able to make all the throws in the pros. I, I mean, there's other barometers. There are guys, Danny Werfel and a few others, that won in college and, and just did not win in the pros. But if you're going to, you know, start eliminating guys, start eliminating guys who didn't win, you know, start putting a greater emphasis on guys who actually won the games. And uh, what the, the criticism on Jared Goff was the arm wasn't strong enough. He gets put in Detroit. He's got a better team around him. And all of a sudden, you know, the criticisms of Jared Goff's arm strength went away, you know, the, the kind of, or at least receded from the number one talking point about him. And, you know, sometimes you can mask a lack of arm strength with the better scheme, better coaching, better wide receivers, uh, well, and also just better strength accuracy and better strength and conditioning habits. I mean, right. I looked at uh, um, Garrett, Jared Goff coming out of Cal, um, and it was clear to me that whoever ran Cal's strength and conditioning program allowed him to skip. It allowed him to skip lifting. He had no upper body. He had the upper body of an eighth grader. 
Um, now here he is a few years later, he's a lot stronger. So somebody at Cal said, Hey, it's not important for Jared to lift. And so he went into the draft. I saw him at the combine and I'm like, dude, there's no shoulder definition. There's no bicep definition. There's no upper body definition at all. This guy has not spent any time lifting. And I mean, any time lifting, um, it was clear. And I guarantee you. Uh, that nobody has footage of Jared Goff lifting at Marin Catholic or at Cal because it never happened. Because if you looked at him at the combine, he was like, dude, there's like 19 guys walking around the mall who have, have bigger upper bodies than you. Right. So he, he didn't spend any time on it. Now look at him. Tom Tom Brady totally different. Do we all know Tom Brady's combine shirt off photo? It just looks like dad bod personified and look at him now. You know I mean? The man went into the lab and he built himself and, that's kind of what we were talking about with Brock Purdy about an hour yeah. ago. You know, what's his off season priority is to add the strength and the arm strength that Dale was asking us about here in the super chat. And so there you go. Thank there you, Dale. You Amar Singh says, uh, Frazier at 31 is good. That's the West Virginia center. And if you watch him, he just, he just buries people and then jumps on top of you and drives blocks you into the turf. Uh, he's 310 pounds. He's tough. Yeah, I like Frazier quite a bit. Uh, Greg Argisi, get a beam in Italy. Get a team in Italy. Montana is the goat and Italian. <laughs> there you go. We'll help the Niners. Uh, with Tommy Cutlets and the Giants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Iceman zero zero seven two probably meant he was born in seventy two. Says football over soccer. What's that little emoji there? I'm it's, not a, sure. it's, a, it's, a, it's a soccer ball. Oh, soccer ball question. You're lazy, Larry. Well, football, I mean, yeah, they love their premiership, but outside of the premiership, football would be king if they if they showed it to the international crowd. Uh, DeGene is versatile. People hate on him because he's white. Well, he's he's a white corner, um, and there's just not a lot of them. So people, people tend to doubt you when there's not a lot of examples of other white corners. When's he's, the last, who's he's our, last, our last great Caucasian corner, Larry? We, we going Jason Seahorn? Yeah, probably. I don't even know if he was great, really. but He was in New York, and he was dating and married to Angie Harmon, so he got a lot of press. That's right. He was. Handsome guy. There, there you go. Um, and we have this one from Eric Hernandez. So Jim Druckenmiller had a gun. But he was dumb as rocks and couldn't play quarterback. There you go. I mean, that's that's a big part of it. You got to be able to play quarterback. You got to find a guy who can play quarterback who has a good arm. That's the other thing. A lot of times people will be like, "Oh, he's got a great arm." Yeah, but can he play quarterback? Oh, hmm. see, that's Jeff George. You just brought. You just summed up Jeff George's career. An arm from heaven, possibly the greatest single arm any quarterback has ever had. Jeff George had. Dan Marino plus John Elway's love child arm talent, but he was a dick and no one liked him. And that's well, the story he, of Jeff and George. He, and he couldn't play. I'll tell you my Jeff George story. So I'm hanging out at the Raider facility. He's a Raider. It's the off season. I'm hanging out with my boy, Bill Urbanek. And he's like, Hey, crew, come over here. Help me watch some of these films. So I go over there. We're watching film. And, um, I see a car pull into the parking lot and it's a nice car. And I'm like, yeah, somebody's here. And I wasn't sure if it was Al Davis, if it was Amy Trask, if it was Joe Bugle, I think was the head coach at the time. Um, and sure enough, guy gets out of the car and I can see who it is. It's Jeff George. I go, Jeff George is here. He's like, shut up. I'm like, Jeff George just got out of his car and he's walking into the facility. He's like, get out of here. He's like, he barely likes to show up in season. We're out of season. And he's like, oh, I know what he's doing. And sure enough, we go downstairs. Jeff George came into the facility. Did he go get a lift? No. Did he go get a meal? No. Did he meet with a coordinator? No. He commandeered one of the offices on the ground floor and made long distance phone calls and charged it to the Raiders. <laughs> That's what he was there for. And when he was done making his long distance phone calls, he got back in his car and drove home. Larry, free cell phone. 
Watch your dimes and your nickels because your dollars take care of themselves. <laughs> Jeff George, very frugal Jeff George. Frugal. Um, well, I tell you, Larry, you know, historically, if you're looking to identify talent in a car when you saw a Miata, that meant Ralph was on the scene. I didn't go over to the Coliseum very much there at the end. I didn't like what they did with it. I didn't like Mount Davis very much at all. But, uh, you know, when you did see the Miata, that meant Ralph was on the scene. You, you know, you know, Ralph, <laughs> all the years you drove, you dragged me onto that radio show. I don't think I ever got one ride in the Miata. But I will say this, Jeff George could play for me, man. Nobody's torn up muscles like this guy. He had injuries. He, he lacked production. He lacked character. He, to me, that's a, that's a Trent Baalke football player right there. And as a football guy, uh, and Ralph, I know you're not a football guy, but Jeff George most certainly is. I love it. Miata. Miata is always the answer from Brunny side up. Thank you indeed. Thank you for watching today. We'll see you again on Friday. Hope everybody has a great day. And remember, don't go out there just trying to get something done. Go out there to tear an ACL and get something done. <laughs>